Hi everybody. Let's start thinking about Baja BC. I think some of you remember that this coming winter, starting in mid-November of 2022, we'll have a brand new series of 26 live streams. And I need to start thinking here this summer about some of those concepts. So I found a couple of old field guides that I'd like to use today and maybe for the next, I don't know, few videos, I'm not quite sure. But I'm here north of Blewett Pass along Ruby Creek and we're gonna start learning a few things together. Learning some things, I guess relearning some things that we did with the exotic terrain series I did a couple of years ago. And of course, breaking new ground as well. So, thanks for joining us, let's get started. All right, so this is daunting for a number of reasons. I haven't thought about exotic terrain stuff for in a couple of years, maybe you haven't either. Maybe you never have, maybe you just caught this channel recently. So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of uh, discoveries to be made. That's exciting, of course. But uh, I think what I'd like to do, and the raindrops are starting to fall here in early July, the, the cool, wet weather continues, but I think maybe we're done for that for a while. Hot weather's coming next week. Um, let's try to make sense of a couple of outcrops here, and we have help, of course. We have help in the form of some field guides. So I've got a few things laid out here. Before it gets too wet, let me record this. Let's see, how are we going to do this? So this is the guide I'm going to use, at least today and maybe beyond that. Bob Bentley just passed away. Robert D. Bentley was a longtime geology professor here at CWU, so I've inherited much of his material. So here's to you, Bob. And this is a collection of field guides from a Geological Society of America national meeting that was held in Seattle, Washington in late October of 1994. Now, I was in Ellensburg at that time, uh, but I was not on this trip. I was new to Washington. I had two young kids at the time. I barely got over to operate some of the slide projectors, I remember, uh, at that GSA meeting. So I was in the dark with much of this detail, but we're going to use this guidebook. And since 1994, there has not been an annual geology meeting of the GSA in Seattle except for 2017. And this is the meeting, the annual meeting that I got reinvigorated, maybe vigorated instead of revigorated, about Baja BC. And uh, we will be using this field guide at some point, often on this summer as well. But it's really this older, what is that, almost 30 year old um, field guide that I'd like to use today and I did some reading last night, forgot I even had this thing. And we're gonna be using a field trip, beautifully done, field trip guide by, no, now we're not using that one, this one. I'm sure that one was good too, Ralph. Uh, Scott Patterson, Bob Miller, you've heard of Bob, Lawford Anderson, Steve Lund, etc. Okay, emplacement and evolution of the Mount Stewart Batholith. So if, if I am doing Baja BC this winter, and I am, I think we need to start with Mount Stewart Batholith, right? That's the whole trigger for me to be interested in this stuff to begin with. So not only is there a bunch of great up-to-date information from 1994, including paleomagnetism, there is these field stops. And we are at stop 1.2. So day one, stop two, low grade Ingalls Complex and Mount Stewart Uplift. And I'll be using that in just a second. Yeah, the raindrops continue to fall, so I think I need to get these papers away. So just to orient you, this morning I left Ellensburg, drove north on 97, up and over blew it. And we're going to look at some of this purple of the Ingalls Ophiolite, or the Ingalls Serpentinite. The pink is Mount Stewart. 
this stuff is either sandstones of the chumstick or sandstones of the swak. And that's a too young situation for us if we're going to start thinking about Baja BC. So the colors that I stumbled upon two years ago when doing an exotic terrain series, green for the Ingalls, gray for the Chewakum, and pink for the Mount Stewart Pluton, or the Mount Stewart Batholith. And we are just off the edge here. We're just in some of the green, next door to some of the swak slash chumstick, which is too young for our focus, and we're not in the Batholith today. Finally, and again, it's getting wet, so I'm going to put it in the pack. This is the key cross section that I put together uh, two years ago, and I still like it. Green Ingalls sitting on top of a thrust fault known as the Windy Pass Thrust Fault. Below the Windy Pass Thrust is the Chewakum Schist. Below the Chewakum Schist is the Nason Ridge. Uh, schist, I guess. Maybe nice. I guess it's nice. And the Mount Stewart Batholith, MSB, or the Mount Stewart Pluton, is the pink that is invading everything. So the numbers might be different as I continue to read and dust off my concepts of this stuff, but this is the relationship we will be thinking about a lot today. And I think if the rain holds off, I want to visit the pink, I want to visit the green, and I want to visit the gray. Right now, we're going to look at a little bit of the green. So we're going to look here before we get back in the car at the low grade Ingalls complex, meaning the part of the Ingalls metamorphic rocks that have not been metamorphosed a whole lot. Low grade means lower temperatures and lower pressures. And we're going to, we're going to see some of these rocks in just a second. It's complicated. There's blocks of massive ultramafic rock, gabbro, diabase, basalt, basinal sedimentary rock, sheared serpentinite matrix. It's a serpentinite melange, probably formed in an oceanic fracture zone. Deformation is brittle, and static ocean floor type metamorphism is characteristic of these rocks of the complex. Okay, so I don't know if I want to bust up there necessarily. Do I? I should. I should. Let's give you a sense of the angles in outcrop form. Nice to be back out here with you. Hope everything's going well for you wherever you are in the world. Chaotic, wouldn't you say? My mind gets paralyzed pretty easily when reading about the Ingalls. There's all these minerals I don't understand, barely even heard of. Hats off to folks who know how to, Jamie McDonald and Bob Miller and many others who know how to pull out all sorts of details in this impossibly complicated collection of deep ocean rocks. I mean, I'm not even that motivated to scramble around on this outcrop because it's too confusing for a guy like me. Like with all this stuff, on a bedrock scale and a local outcrop scale, I don't typically get that excited. And maybe you do, but I, I don't. Maybe, maybe your view is like, oh, this would look good in the yard. This would good look good in the garden. For me, besides knowing that we're on an ocean floor and we're part of the ocean floor itself, 162 million years ago, and also beyond knowing that if we go down to the Josephine Ophiolite in Southern Oregon, and it's the same stuff, and apparently the same age of 162 million years. Beyond that, 
don't really know how to get excited about this Ingalls, but if I do hook up with Bob Miller next week, I'm sure he's up to the challenge to get me excited. And I think Mike Eddie's gonna be along on that little hike, so maybe he'll be getting both Mike and I amped about this Ingalls Ophiolite. Doesn't put up much of a fight, I gotta say. So if this kind of stuff turns you on, and you're looking for little slick insides and you're looking for other kind of waxy structures and you're looking for cordierite or whatever the hell, sorry Patrick, then uh, this stuff's here waiting for you at Ruby Creek right off of US 97. All right, I think I'm bored. Let's follow the guidebook and go through Leavenworth and head towards either the Mount Stewart granite or the Chewakam schist. Thank you. Okay, this is not public land. It's a private quarry right here in Leavenworth, Washington. So I'm not gonna give you the location, but the rocks are quite impressive. We continue with the Scott Patterson and Bob Miller Mount Stewart Batholith Field Guide from 1994. Please note this is an active quarry. Amphibolites and less abundant hornblende biotite schists in this quarry are part of a belt of amphibolite facies rocks of the Ingalls. So we're still in the Ingalls Ophiolite. The dominant assemblage in the amphibolites at the quarry, which were probably derived mainly from Ingalls basalt. So you take a basalt on the ocean floor, you add temperature and pressure, it becomes a metamorphic rock called amphibolite. Hornblende plagioclase, plus or minus biotite, diopside, and quartz. East dipping, steep foliation. Slick insides, where we have faults shifting rock past each other. Okay, so what's it look like? I mean, it's quite handsome, wouldn't you say? So we were looking at low-grade Ingalls at the first stop, meaning the salt on the ocean floor that was at, uh, exposed to moderate amounts of temperature and pressure. Now this is the result of taking that same ocean floor but adding considerably more temperature and pressure to create a high-grade metamorphic rock. I got my hammer, but I don't know if I want to start banging away. I'm going to call attention to me being in here. I'm just sneaking in for a few minutes. Nobody's around at the moment. Hopefully not creating a problem. I won't forget the field guide, but let me just go up here to the outcrop. Yeah, you can see the steeply dipping foliation. I assume that's what that is. But man, this is really unique looking. Oh, wow, look at this. So I've seen plenty of Inkles serpentinite north of Ellensburg, but I've never seen it cooked to this degree, I don't think. Uh, that would be a very pleasant place to be, but I'm just following the guide. Already looked at that one. Yes, there's plenty of iron in these rocks, so there's all sorts of iron staining oftentimes. Wow, look at this one. Can't get it out. Too big. Yeah, very impressed with this, despite the setting. All right, I think I got to bang a couple of, just, just to give you a sense of how delicate this stuff might be versus how compact it is. Let's try this stuff right here. Yeah, it's hard.
I'd read you more of the verbiage in the field guide, but I don't know if I would understand it. Maybe you would understand better than me, but what's the point? I'm just trying to give you a sense of some of this. Oh. High-grade metamorphic rock within the Ingalls exotic terrain. 162 million years old. Chewakam Schist. All right, you just enjoyed a few moments with the babbling water. That was Tumwater Canyon and the Wenatchee River flowing along US Highway 2. I'm not far from that now, but I'm near Chewakam Creek and another little private quarry following along with the 1994 guidebook. But before we get to the details here, I mean, just looking at these rocks without knowing it, without having the guide, I think I would just assume this is more Ingalls. There's that rusty brown to orange, a lot of iron in these rocks. I think I could talk myself into kind of a greenish look. So, you know, if I was brought here and told I was near Leavenworth, I would assume we're in Ingalls, but we are not. We are in the Chewakam Schist. So let's go back to my handouts, first of all, to remind ourselves of the positioning in a cross section and on a map, and then we can walk up on the outcrop and look a little bit more carefully. So here's what I showed you at the first stop, reminding you what the plan is. We are looking today at the Ingalls Ophiolite. We just looked at that in two different spots. We are now in the gray, the Chewakam Schist. And you'll notice there's a black line with a bunch of black triangles on it. That's the Windy Pass Thrust Fault. And invading both the Chewakam Schist and the Ingalls and the Windy Pass Thrust is these blotches of pink. That's the Mount Stewart Pluton. So we are now right in this gray just to the northwest of the Windy Pass Thrust. So, you know, I've looked at these maps off and on over the years, didn't quite click with me until I drew this for myself. So here's a reminder that I'm drawing a cross section through this area, basically slicing into the earth and taking a peek underground. And cartoonishly, Ingalls is the hanging wall of the thrust fault the Chewakam Schist, which we're in now, is the foot wall of the Windy Pass Thrust. And then eating up through everything 93 million years ago is the Mount Stewart Pluton. Why is this important? Well, I can't hold it. I got to say it. Remember, it's this pink that is the absolute centerpiece of Baja BC. And Merle Beck and others say that this pluton was a blob of liquid that came up through the green, the gray, and the brown 93 million years ago. But where did Merle say the blob came up? Down in Mexico. And if this is Mexico, then that means these guys were in Mexico as well, right? Because we have the age of crystallization and the paleomagnetic details in the pink granite, it's not pink in real life, but it's pink on this, this is where we start our discussion of Baja BC, and it is where we start the discussion 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, 1972. 
is the first Baja BC paper. So yeah, there's all these other Plutons up in the North Cascades and Stacia Gordon and Bob Miller and Mike Eddy and all the different generations of magmatic flare-ups. I'm starting with the part of the crystalline core that is closest to Ellensburg. But I did find this from a couple years ago. I barely remember what I was talking about. But this Joachim Schist, which we're about to look at in hand sample, has multiple folding events. These age windows, certain minerals that are showing up at certain temperatures and pressures. And yes, that says garnets, kyanite, starolite, I don't know, andalusite, I don't know. For all I know, I'm gonna show you some rocks and they'll have some of those crystals within them and I won't even know the difference. You probably know more than I do. Okay, that's to whet your appetite for what to me looks like, I don't know, I'm just showing my preference now. I'm not that excited at the moment. But let's go up over there at some outcrop and a little bit of float. See if we can't bang open a few rocks. Thank you. Okay, there's so much iron staining, so much brown, that I don't know if we're going to get a good easy look in outcrop at this Chewakam schist. But I guess my plan is to just stop and bang on a few things that look like they're not nearly as weathered as others. Striking. A few raindrops thrown in for ambiance. Yeah, some obvious quartz veins and other things that don't look Inglesy. So I guess that would have, if I would, if I didn't have this field guide, I suppose that would have started to cause me to doubt whether this was Ingles or not. Again, it is not. It's Chewakam Schist. All right, so this is maybe decent looking Chewakam Schist. Let's bake open a little bit and then we'll read together. Looks like a good sitting rock, actually. Actually. I don't know, what am I looking at? Am I supposed to get excited here? I don't think I'm excited at the moment. Now, a couple summers ago, I was in the icicle drainage. I'm not sure if I'll head there this afternoon. And that was a spot where there were some garnets visible. I don't see any garnets right here. Let's, let's read. Oh, I just took a seat without wanting to. That was fun. All right, I underlined a few things. Let's grab a few items here. Very helpful. Joachim Schist, multiply deformed and metamorphosed Politic and lesser amphilitic 
amph amphibolitic schists. So politic, I think, means it used to be mud way back in the day. Bedding rarely preserved. Folds, crenulation cleavages. Okay, I'm starting to get sleepy. Pelites at this stop have been an assemblage of quartz, biotite, muscovite, staurolite, garnet, and opaques with staurolite and garnet forming parphoblasts visible in hand sample. Yeah, I don't, I don't see them here. Do you? Well, maybe I do. Are those garnets? And they're just, are those pink things garnets and they're just discolored? And yeah, maybe they are. This whole thing's kind of rotten. Are we rotten because we're, we're pretty close to the fault? Are we rotten because we're close to the Pluton, the Mount Stewart Pluton was just, you know, less than a couple miles away. Is this not the best place to look at the Chewakam schist? And if it's not, why did Bob and Scott take people here? All right, let's... I mean, there's a lot of exposure, that's for sure, but I don't know if I'm seeing anything that really excites me. So, what does excite me, that this Chewakam schist is just, let me flip you around. All right, well, I'm starting to ask myself some rather basic questions. But we got to start somewhere. This stuff, I think, was originally ocean mud. And when and where did it convert it to metamorphic rock? I guess from that sheet I just showed you, which is in my pack now, we have these ages for these multiple generations of metamorphisms. But did that all happen here in Washington? Or did we go from deep mud to metamorphic rock schist down in Mexico? Or did we do it out in the ocean? Something? No, that doesn't make any sense. Same for the Ingalls Ophiolite. That went from ocean floor basalt and pillows and other things that you find at gabbros and sheeted dikes on the ocean floor, when did we apply that metamorphic temperature and pressure? Is that part of the Rangelian friends thing and all that? A hundred million years ago? Like, I'm just starting to dust off this stuff that we were talking about routinely last winter and then the previous winter. So I guess I'm realizing that there's a lot of dusting that needs to happen here, and I was the guy doing it with you. So if I need to dust it off, I'm guessing most of you do as well. And for all I know, some of you are brand new to the channel and you, you don't even know what I'm talking about. So I guess over the next maybe, well, over the rest of the summer, I think I'm not only going to be making more videos that are kind of helping me get back in the game mentally, talking about the Cretaceous, talking about events that happened older than 50 million years ago with exotic terrains and magmatic flare-ups. But I guess for those that are really wanting to enjoy this upcoming Baja BC A to Z live stream series, which will start in mid-November and go through mid-February. I don't know, I guess I need to start watching some of those previous programs myself, and maybe we'll all have a little bit of homework to do for those that are really wanting to enjoy this winter at its fullest. I don't know, I need to start thinking about that. But we have learned some things together, but I think the first step is just to remember what the hell we were talking about. And finding some of my old cartoons and things will be a first step. Let's finish this video by going over to the Mount Stewart Pluton. Just get a little visual there so that we have in this little video the Holy Trinity.
the Ingalls Ophiolite, the Chewakum Schist, and then invading from below, Mount Stewart Pluton. Thank you. Up here in the Stewart Range, near the trailhead up to Colchuck Lake and the Enchantments, I'm still following the 1994 field guide. And in this case, the group of geologists back in late October of 1994 got their way up here to look at some outcrop. And I'm intrigued by what I read just a moment ago. So let's go ahead and crack open the book once we get down to the outcrop. A little bit of snow hanging on. Ellensburg is up and over. <laughs> kind of hard to believe, huh? Looks a little different over here. Is that Mount Stewart straight ahead? No, that's on the north side of the Icicle Creek drainage. But this is much of what you see is just a portion of the Mount Stewart Batholith or Mount Stewart Pluton. It's mid-afternoon and a bunch of day hikers are nursing some sore feet and on their way down to enjoy some beer and brats in Leavenworth. Okay, so this is the reason for our last stop and there are plenty of there's no shortage of exposures of the Mount Stewart Batholith but according to the guidebook this is the most intermediate looking in other words this is quite representative of Stewart Pluton Yes, there are some more mafic, in other words, darker colored portions of this important pluton. It's a nice little hand sample right there. Very nice. So I think we want to visualize this when we talk about the Stuart pluton. And boy, oh boy, are we going to talk about the Stuart pluton this winter. If it's not clear to you now, I'll leave that one for you right here. If it's not clear to you now, I hope it will be clear to you by February of 2023, when we're done with the Baja BC A to Z series, why the Stuart Pluton, the Mount Stuart Batholith, is the centerpiece of it all. So let's get the hammer out, let's get the field guide out, and uh, see if we can see what Miller and Patterson were talking about here on this Forest Service road. I like this color scheme, I'm going to stick with it. So you've already seen this twice today, I'm doing it one more. We are now in the pink. We are in the Mount Stewart Pluton, same over here, is the big hook of this. This heads all the way up to Stevens Pass, this, this Pluton of, of liquid magma that ate its way up through. And to remind you of what that looks like in cross section, we are now in this stuff. I know I say 93 million, but it's really 96 to 91 million years. And there's a lot of it. This stop illustrates some of the characteristics of deformation of the Mount Stewart tonalite. That's 
That's a light-colored granitic rock. During the transition from near solidus to subsolidus conditions, we are in an intermediate zone between typical Mount Stewart granitoids, characterized by relatively weak, steep magmatic foliation. The strong magmatic foliation defined by biotite hornblende and plagioclase is weakly overprinted by a parallel high temperature subsolidus foliation. Okay, so the idea right off the bat is that there's been careful study. Come on, Gizmo. There's been careful study of these minerals and they're not quite as randomly arranged as you would expect to find in a granite, you know what I mean? Like in a, in a well-behaved granite, meaning the most perfect granite, you're going to have minerals that are just randomly pointing this way and that. It's just a blob of liquid that's cooling. But these guys are saying there's something going on uh, as the magma is cooling. Or at least when, when we do have some near solidus, meaning this, this liquid is cooled off to the point where it's more solid than it is liquid. I think that's what they mean. And they actually say something unusual. The most interesting features of this road cut are diffuse, narrow, hypersolidus to high temperature subsolidus ductal shear zones that are associated with swirled open folds of foliation. These ductal shear zones are variably oriented and give inconsistent kinematics. Similar shear zones are best developed near the Windy Pass thrust in the Pioneer Creek domain and another portion of this area. Okay, down here is what I want to say. We're not going to stop four, but here's what they're after. We infer that the movement on the thrust fault formed in the intense foliation of the batholith as the gentle dipping, as the gently dipping structures occur along a projection of the thrust into the batholith, and their orientation is similar to that of cycle three structures in the Chewakam schist. Movement on the thrust probably occurred while the melt was still present, and solidification of the batholith may have led to cessation of the thrust movement or caused displacement to be partitioned elsewhere into the weaker schist. Okay, new idea for me. So if we go back to our map, we're seeing simply that this liquid magma ate its way up through the green, the gray, and the brown, including the windy pass thrust, and this stuff is just kind of passively squirting up through. What these guys are saying in this 1994 guide, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to find these shears for you, is that they're saying that, did you read it? Did you, did you get a sense of what they were saying? I think that what they're saying is they think they see some of this thrusting, and they can follow this thrust fault faintly through the pluton, indicating that we're not totally done with this shoving. You know, this is, these are the pizza boxes. Did you watch two years ago? I had an analogy of pizza boxes stacked one on top of another, and I would slide one frozen pizza box along a surface, a thrust fault, uh, most famously over at the San Juan Islands. Well, I think what Bob Miller and Scott Patterson and Lawford Anderson and others are saying is that the pizza box shoving is not totally done by the time we squirt this liquid up through the scene, as I'm indicating. And that the timing of thrust activity and the timing of magma in invading from below is very close in time based on these foliations or these kind of shear zones within this plutonic igneous rock. That's my understanding at present. Now, I hate to finish on a loose end, but I guess that's what this is about. Can I stand up first of all? Can I break open a few rocks? 
and can we see this shear zone or this or this foliation or this sense that the that there's deformation within this pluton I don't know shit sorry Patrick I don't know but let me try so we need an outcrop face like what would we look at here I don't think we're looking at the fractures the fractures I don't really know what I'm talking about now, but the fractures I, I think are, I assume are much younger and are not what is being discussed at the moment. Uh, what if we come and see a couple of faces? Is this a needle in the haystack thing or is this, or is this shearing super obvious? It's almost like a Skagit nice thing now. I remember them talking about following shear zones through the Skagit Nice. Oh boy. I don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, I don't know how to find those sheared structures within this batholith. But the field trip and the geologists stopped at this very spot to, dis to observe and then to discuss this shearing. Do you see it? I don't see it. I really don't think it's the fractures themselves. I think it's the, the patterns of the minerals. Well, maybe something like this. Oh, this is more of an inclusion than anything. Okay, I'm just guessing that what they're meaning is that the orientation of these black minerals is not totally random. So I think this is significant. I think an outcrop like this is significant because apparently it shows, it demonstrates that all this magma that you see is invading while the thrusting is still happening. And I think I read somewhere that these guys think that they have thrusting to the north. Now we're going back, you know, almost 100 million years ago. So it's probably difficult to be super confident that you know which direction north is. I mean, who says we can't rotate everything a bunch? But regardless of the direction of uh, movement, like cardinal direction of movement, I guess we're seeing a fabric in this pluton that indicates that there's been deformation within this while the thrust faulting is going on, or at least late in the game. Kind of interesting. I, I should bang a couple rocks off in here. Uh, yeah. Now remember, this is the Mount Stewart batholith. So some of these minerals are magnetic, and it's those magnetites that have been carefully studied to indicate the paleo latitude of this magma when it was crystallized underground while the thrusting was happening. I don't want to hurt this one. I think I want to take this one home. I'm not going to leave that one for you. I'm going to take it home. I like it. And I might be able to, if I'm, conv if I'm helped by Bob Miller next week, I might be able to show this winter by holding this up to the camera and showing the sense of motion. Still not super confident. I know what I'm talking about. I don't know, does this look like a granite in your neighborhood? Does this look like granite you know, on your countertops in your kitchen?
I see one up here that catches my eye. It looks like it's a little bit more quartz rich than others. I'll give you the GPS location for this spot if you want to see it. Not only get a context of the Mount Stewart Batholith, but also maybe you can see this deformation thing that I cannot. But there's no shortage of beautiful granite here. Thank you for watching this video. I love you and goodbye.